Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour à tous. It's an honor and a privilege for me to serve as Canada's High Commissioner to Singapore and to join you here today. Canada is proud of its 10-year collaboration with the Milken Institute, and I'm especially delighted to have the opportunity, like you, to benefit from the leadership lessons that we'll be hearing shortly from five very distinguished panelists. Before turning to them, I wanted to offer a few words on the panel's leadership theme. But rather than taking myself as an example, I'll focus my remarks instead on Canada and the leadership role that my country seeks to play as we celebrate in 2017 our 150th birthday. Thank you. So in a climate of uncertainty with the world facing clear challenges ranging from climate change to radical extremism. Are there ideas to be drawn from the Canadian experience? Let me suggest three. First, gender equality. Our government believes that gender equality is an essential component of sustainable development, social justice, peace and security. We know that when women succeed, communities succeed. So our Prime Minister has appointed a cabinet that's 50% female and is naming as many women as men to represent our country abroad. Canada has also launched a feminist international assistance policy. So by 2021, no less than 95% of our bilateral international assistance initiatives will target gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Second, diversity and inclusion. Canada, like Singapore, our host, is a multicultural nation. One in five Canadians were born outside of the country, and that rises to one in two in our largest city, Toronto, where over 140 languages are spoken. We see thus diversity as a source of strength, not weakness. Within a culture of respect, peace, order, and good government, diversity is coupled with inclusion, which allows ideas and innovation based on global perspectives to flourish. And third, progressive trade. Canada is a trading nation. Far from seeing trade as a zero-sum game, we believe in trading relationships that can benefit all parties. Through our progressive trade agenda, Canada is seeking to build an open, rules-based international trading system based on green growth, economic inclusion, and shared economic gains. Our recent trade agreement with the European Union is one example, and now we're working with our continental partners to modernize NAFTA along similar terms. We're also engaged in a number of initiatives across Asia in an effort to increase trade and investment flows and strengthen innovative partnerships in the region. The launch just a few days ago of exploratory discussions towards the Canada ASEAN FTA is one such initiative. Canada now leads our G7 and G20 partners in many important categories, including our highly educated multicultural workforce, innovation climate, competitiveness, and overall economic performance. Canada was also ranked first among 55 countries by the Reputation Institute based on good quality of life, our advanced economy, effective government, and appealing environment. So we'd suggest that these leadership attributes make Canada a competitive business location of choice and an ideal trading partner. We welcome foreign investment and look forward to continuing to work with global, regional, and local partners to build partnerships for economic prosperity, further sustainable and inclusive growth, and contribute to peace and security. As I said, this year is our birthday, 150 years. I invite all of you to learn a bit more about Canada and see for yourself what Canada in 2017 is all about. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Next up, we will be exploring leadership lessons from the road less traveled. Please welcome the panel and your moderator, CNBC Asia Pacific anchor, Oriel Morrison.
Welcome, everyone. We're very, very excited to be here. Now, I know that uh, Lynn just gave us a, a great introduction, but you don't actually, I think, need personal introductions to people that are sitting here on this stage, because I'm sure that you all very well know exactly who they are. But John, of course, John Wood is at the end. Jeremy Collar, Naomi Campbell, Joe Sai, and Mika Heikkinen um, with us today on this panel. Now, the title of the panel is Leadership Lessons from the Road Less Travelled. And what we have here on, on the panel is a, a group of people that are very, very successful in their own individual field, fields. But they're all very, very different fields, of course. And what we want to try and achieve today is we want to find out you know, what is it that these people have done with their lives to make their experiences so special. And of course, they're all sharing them very much with all of us uh, here today and elsewhere in the community. So I think probably the best place to start is to find out what really makes a leader from a leader's perspective. What do the people on, these panel, on this panel today all have in common? You know, when they look out at other leaders and, and say, you know, what is it that makes these people special? So Joe, I'm going to put that first question to you because you are an incredible leader yourself. You work for an amazing company, but not only that, you work with an amazing leader in Jack Ma, one who dresses up as Michael Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> which is incredible in itself. Right. And we should really ask Joe what he dressed up as. Well, uh, this, so this is, uh, this is what they call being put on the spot moment. <laughs> Uh, but I would like to say that this is probably my selfie moment, being sitting, you know, sitting next to Mika and Naomi and, and, and you. I'm sorry, John and Jeremy, not as important uh, uh, for, from a photo session standpoint. But uh, uh, Making I, friends already. Yeah, I'm making friends already. I want to stay on this side. Yeah. Just, lost, on the just side. lost my business. <laughs> um, I, I look at, I look at my, my own experience. I think a couple of traits that are very important for, uh, for leadership uh, are number one, uh, keeping a promise. When you say uh, that you wanna do something and delivering on that promise is very, very important. Uh, I don't mean having to deliver quarterly profits. That's, uh, we, we usually don't make any promises uh, on that front. But internally, when we manage people, uh, when you say that you're going to show up in this meeting at this certain time when you want to do this or that, uh, keeping that promise is important because lots of people rely on you. That's how you build trust. Uh, the second thing about leadership, I, uh, you know, in my own experience, is uh, a humility. Uh, you have to be humble enough to understand that there are a lot of people that are smarter than you are, that are better than you are. Uh, so Jack Welch once said that class A people hire other class A people. Class B people hire class C people. So I say that to illustrate that, you know, the point of humility is that you have to be able to hire people that are better than you are, that are smart, smarter than you are, uh, to come into the organization and build the business and scale the business as a team. Uh, so uh, those are the two things that I think are quite important in uh, when we look at leadership. Mm. Probably slightly harder in a business like yours, Naomi, necessarily to find those traits in the people that are around you. So how do you stay above that? I mean, no, I think you have to find humility no matter what you do. Mm. Um, in terms of traits, we're dealing with so many different people every day, um, depending on how many jobs you do in the day. and. Um, I think, no, the bottom line is for any great job that you want to do, the denomination of your commitment and having the best people around you, working with the best people, um, I would say, in my line of work and learning. Um, I've gotten to learn from some of the great photographers who are no longer with us. And so it's just like, you know, building, stepping stones. I'm always happy in my career that I had stepping stones that I never got everything all at once, because I think I would have lost everything all at once. Mm. So um, stepping tones is important. Humility, I think that comes from your background and how you, you know, you're, what you're taught before you leave and go into the world, and then you learn as you go along. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, I just think commitment and believing in yourself 
it's one of the things that's, there's so many different ways because our business is also based on surface and how you look and you say to a, a girl, we don't want you for the casting, they can take it very deeply. You have to be so careful, it's a very thin line of how you tell that to someone. You know, we've, we've had some very tragic incidents. So, yeah, it's a tricky, fickle, but wonderful merry-go-round business. Mm. Well, it is very much, you know, you have to look down. With, with what you do comes great responsibility. Well, you don't think so. Like, I think my generation of women, like Cindy, Christy, Linda, we never thought that we had a responsibility. We never had social media. We just had the press. They would, they would find out, they would write it. So it this so happened one day, we suddenly started reading, like, what we eat for breakfast and what we... And we were like, wait a second... This is now we feel a responsibility which we didn't necessarily want to feel and didn't know how to deal with that and what to do with it. And so, um, you know, that's also something. In my business, there is no book that teaches you how to be, what to expect, how it's going to go. You just are basically thrown in. I was thrown in at 15 at a very young age, and you deal with it and you learn as you go. So, um, we are trying now to have some guidelines in our business, but there are very few. Mm, and far between. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, what about you? I mean, again, it's a very, very different business, obviously. Well, you have been a model in your past life, have you not? I have charisma. <laughs> but um, I, no, I was just thinking what Joe and Naomi were saying. And I, I, I would add to that that you have to be unreasonable, actually. It's that, uh, you know, the, Bernard Shaw said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. Mm -hmm. The unreasonable man adapts the world to himself. And, um, and therefore, the world progresses through being unreasonable. And, um, you know, and, and, and also paranoid. So I'm taking the negative side of it. Mm. Oops. Glad no one heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have self-confidence in yourself. <laughs> no, I think that different things drive different people. And um, for me, it's been very much fear of failure. Uh, that's, that's been a driving force. And, and just having a, a long-term goal and then working out under what conditions can you get there. And, and I think I'm probably very different to a lot of people on this panel because um, I always thought it was luck that, that, uh, that um, until, a, until a few years ago, until I, I started um, a, a sort of second career alongside... The, pioneering and industrializing a whole part of private equity, which is, which is um, uh, an, another career which is to, to really have an impact on ending factory farming of animals. And, and I've been hugely surprised by the success of that initiative. We've got over three trillion in get, of assets under management to be engaged in, in, in influencing the way that companies behave towards other animals and um, uh, you know and so suddenly you're you're being inspired by self-actualization rather than fear of failure and, and that's I think is a very good point because with everybody that's here on the panel everybody has almost had a, an initial career and then a secondary career i.e what you're doing now you may be the exception joe because you've been doing what you've been doing for for, for quite some time now my, my current job is only 18 years but i did something uh, quite different before <laughs> what what was that you were modeling uh <laughs> even better than that i was a tax lawyer <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I agree that that's necessarily better. But anyway, moving right along. And that is most certainly something that you've done, Mika. You know, you, you've taken your career. I mean, everybody knows what you've done. Right? Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a great, uh, great uh, time when I was uh, doing my motor racing career. I, I started when I was five years old. So I was quite a, quite a young kid. Uh, <laughs> it started to be, it was a hobby in the first place, but then 
on the way of the years. Uh, it became a job, and, and it, was a, it was great fun. But it, it was hard, hard work because it was, like a, it was like a university. You know, you have to get the best degree to become the number one. So uh, you really have to have a great discipline to become the best driver of the world. And uh, on the way, it was interesting to how to, how to manage yourself become good. Uh, and it, it was a lot of to do with the teamwork when you're working with the people. Uh, so when you're in a racing car, you need to be really selfish. I mean, really selfish. You just have to think about yourself, how you can manage to be number one. But when you step out of the car, you have to be a team player. You have to communicate with engineers, the mechanics, the marketing, the media, and, and, the, and the whole concept was happening around it. Mm. And it was very challenging. So it was not something what you, what you learn uh, when you're born in this world. You know, you have to study and learn from your mistakes how to become good in these areas. And, and uh, it was it was great, great journey. So I retired in, in 2001 in Formula One, and since then I've been involved with the business. And, and I carry this experience from Formula One, the business world where I'm in today. And it's, it's fascinating, it's fun, it's exciting. And a lot of people ask me very often, said, where you found this bus, you know, what you had in when you were driving Formula One? And I found it from the business life, it is very similar. Founding the right people who are intelligent individuals to support uh, me to go forward in the success of the business. So it's a good fun. How much of that comes down to self-confidence? In self-confidence? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you win a world championship twice, you know, it, it gives you... <laughs> <You're> self-confidence? <laughs> it gives you pretty good confidence, you know. <laughs> you know you're pretty good then. <laughs> John, let me bring you into the conversation here from all the way down the end. You might want to move your chair a little bit forward if you can so I can see you. <laughs> but, I mean, let's talk about what you've done because you, you had an exceptionally successful career at Microsoft and you gave all of that away and, and all of the perks that a career like that entails, which mm -hmm. is the credit card that you never see, to dedicate yourself and your life to children and educating children and teaching them to read. You'd have to back yourself to do something like that, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd have to have, as selfless as it is, you'd have to have a certain amount of self-confidence to believe that you can succeed. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I think my leadership transition was really going from the formal authority of having a staff and a budget and a title and a position at a company like Microsoft in the 1990s as it grew meteorically. But the reality is that most people who met with me met with me because they had to meet with me. They reported to me or they're running an ad agency or a PR agency and I ran marketing for APAC for Microsoft. So that was a more of a formal leadership position. Once you become the crazy guy who you know, is running an NGO, I didn't make enough money at Microsoft to start a foundation. I made enough money to start a cash-strapped NGO. And literally I went, you know, if you go to a dinner party, the first thing people ask you is, what do you do? And I went from director of business development for Microsoft Greater China to saying I deliver books on the back of yaks in rural Himalayan villages, at which point you are standing at the chip dip all alone, because people don't really want it. And Mika, I know you're jealous that while you were doing Formula One, I was piloting yaks and Himalayas, <laughs> but those were you know, very humble beginnings. And so it became more informal leadership that people didn't follow me or meet with me because they had to. I had to convince them that to want to take the meeting with me, and especially as Hellman knows at Credit Swiss table, Taking a meeting with me means I'm going to ask you to do something, to make, write a check to get your company involved, whatever it would be. I think I've learned three things from that now in the last 17 years, growing the organization to over 12 million students reached across 15 countries. Three quick things. Um, number one is always having an attitude of gratitude. I think the best leaders spend a lot of time thanking those who are in their organizations. When we do a big gala, Singapore, Hong Kong, Zurich, whatever it is, the next day, we have a four-hour chunk of time set aside we call the Thankathon. All hands on deck, you're in a conference room, you've got your phones fully charged, you've got good old-fashioned note cards and pens and stamps and envelopes. So if someone writes you a large check, they get an email that day, they get a phone call that day, and three days later in the mailbox, we don't get enough good stuff in our mailbox these days that's personal, they get a handwritten thank you note. 
I believe that the time I spend thanking our 10,000 plus volunteers, our 20,000 plus donors, our 1,400 employees, I believe that is the highest ROI in my time. I can't scientifically prove that, but part of leadership is when you know to trust your gut, I know that time is valuable. I don't have any more money in the bank immediately as a result of it, but I know it's valuable. Um, secondly, I would say, it's to echo what Joe said, is, um, is just to stay humble and stay hungry. One of my mentors said, you're unknown today, back in 2000, because one day you guys will be the biggest education NGO in the developing world. This is a Goldman Sachs partner, Manir Sauter. He predicted it. It came true. He said, but you're going to have people praise you. You're going to go from the unknown guy to the, people who, the guy who's praised, and you're going to have like, kind of this halo effect. And he said, stay humble, stay hungry. He said, every morning, remind yourself of how many kids you haven't reached. Every morning, remind yourself of how many countries Room to Read is not working in. Every day, remind yourself that you're competing against ISIS and Al-Qaeda for the hearts and minds of young children. And just stay humble. And Joe, I just met Joe for the first time. He, is, he doesn't just say he's humble. Joe literally is thanking the person who fills his water glass. And that's one thing I always look for when I go to lunch with somebody is do they, do they, treat, the, this people, do they treat people well or do they not? So I think hung, um, humbleness and humility and staying hungry are super important. And then I think for me, the third is to echo a bit what Jeremy says, is to be unreasonable, to set the big, hairy, audacious goal and just literally wake up every day like a, I'm like a dog with a chew toy. You know, you're just focused, focused, focused. When we started Room to Read, my co-founders and I said, we're going to reach 10 million children with the lifelong gift of education by the year 2020. And I was told that was a crazy hubristic goal. A lot of major foundations that I tried to pitch kind of laughed at me like, yeah, that's really cute. You're going to reach 10 million students by 2020. And I said, no, that's our moonshot. I'm not giving up the perks and the stock options at Microsoft to go small. I want to be scalable. In the same way that Alibaba is scalable, I want to be scalable. So we set a goal, 10 million kids by 2020. We said bigger than Andrew Carnegie, because Carnegie opened 2,500 libraries in his lifetime. Um, we're now, at, by the end of this year, going to be at 20,000 libraries. So we'll be 8x Andrew Carnegie. And we said faster than Starbucks. We hung a big graph on our wall of Starbucks post-IPO. How many outlets do they open post-IPO? Because if the world needs a good latte, the world damn well needs literacy in a world where 770 million people lack it. So we looked at that. In the first couple of years, Starbucks is ahead of us. Obviously, they have access to private capital markets. They can pay more money. Uh, I can only give stock options that pay off karmically in the afterlife. So we're at several <laughs> disadvantages. Easy then. But with the support of a lot of committed capitalists in this room and a lot of major financial institutions and hedge funds and PE, they got on board. And I'm proud to say that by our third year, we were actually opening outlets faster than Starbucks. And in our first decade, we actually opened 2,000 more libraries than Starbucks opened outlets in its first decade after the IPO. And that was all because we were somewhat unreasonable and said, we believe in the big, hairy, audacious goal. Bold goals attract bold people. Wimpy goals attract wimpy people. If I'd said we're going to reach 1,000 kids, people would say, great, good luck, have at it. You can do that on your own. So we said 10 million kids requires us to build a global movement. And that takes a lot of time out evangelizing. I think we need a round of applause here, guys. So I just point out before I forget that at the end um, I'm going to open to the floor for, for only about five to ten minutes so I'm letting you know now just so you have the chance to think about it if you do want to ask a question we've got two roving mics so you just stick up your hand as you probably have before I just wanted to give you a heads up so for all the people sitting on the panel if you had a leader in front of you who you respected and you thought did an amazing job what would be that you would ask that person you want to start that off? Huh. It's not an easy question. I mean, you know, so what would you want to know from another leader? I think I'd want to, I think I'd want to know, actually I did want to know, in order for him to help children the right way, would he step down from being a leader? And he did. And this person was President Nelson Mandela. So in order for him to make an make awareness and to raise funds to help others, he had to step down, and that's what I, I wanted to know, and he did. Mm. What, what was the best thing that you learned from Nelson Mandela? I mean, so you've spoken things. before. So many things, um, 20 years of a great um, friendship, and I didn't have to even speak, it was just being in his presence. Um, he was very, he had a very unconditional love, forgiveness, never complained, never said a bad word about anyone. 
actually never left jail when they said he was free. He stayed an extra two weeks so that people could get used to the feeling of him being free. And his, his constitution of just being humble uh, was incredible. And um, I learned a lot from him. Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. Hope it did for you all too. What about you, Joe? Um, well, I, you, you tend to sort of idolize somebody that you're not, mm. uh, or someone who has traits that, that it's hard for you to achieve. So I, uh, I, I look at uh, another leader um, uh, who's my father. Uh, he didn't run a big business. He, he was a lawyer. He's, he's passed away uh, four years ago. Um, and uh, I want to know uh, how he can tell jokes that can make the whole room laugh <laughs> uh, because he's famous for telling jokes. <laughs> and he's so famous for telling jokes that uh, people want to, every time he gets, you know, he, he's at an event like this, uh, people say, hey, Paul, uh, that's his name, uh, please tell a joke. And uh, uh, so he once told a joke and then there was dead silence. Uh, all of his friends said, Paul, we've heard that joke. <laughs> you, you need a new joke. And my dad said, I don't need a new joke. I need a new audience. <laughs> so. so can I ask you to tell a joke? Uh, <laughs> I think I just did. Uh, but I think the point here is uh, he is a very witty man. He's, he's funny as hell. Uh, uh, but just being able to connect with people, uh, uh, that's something I'm constantly trying to learn. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mika? What would you, if you, you had somebody, what would it be? Who would it be? Michael Schumacher? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, when, I, when I was racing, I had a lot of different uh, managers and, and uh, team leaders, team owners, uh, big companies who were partner of the team. Mm -hmm. and, and always it was fascinating to, to follow these people, how they, how they do they behavior what's to other people, how they are leading, how they going forward in their life. And, and I, I thought always it's, it's, if, if you're a good leader, you, you have to let the people be able to make mistakes. You know, it's not, you don't have to be perfect all the time, but you can be every day a little bit better. But, but you have to make mistakes to learn. And, and uh, I think that's a, that's a good, Good leader, in my opinion. So, so what was the biggest mistake that you learned throughout your career that... Oh, I, knew, I, knew, I never did make mistakes. <laughs> 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 no, no, uh, but let, let's... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, no, uh, it, might have been a mistake to come on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but actually talking about one thing, you know, my, my dad, uh, when I was a young kid, about... 14 years old, and, and I was doing a go-karting. And, and uh, if I made a mistake, I was really, really annoyed. You were really, really uh, not so happy. And he said, Mika, don't, don't show your emotions here in the paddock. You know, walk in the forest and kick some trees and let your frustration <laughs> out. And, okay, that's what I did. I walked in the forest, I was kicking trees, and I was thinking, well, what the hell I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> this, this doesn't make sense at all. So, <laughs> it teaches it, 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 it me the lesson that way, you know, uh, you know, when you are doing your business, your work, you know, take, take care of your emotions and focus for your work. You've been kicking trees too in the forest? Yeah, I, 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 I think I remember seeing a footage of you at a race. You got out and walked into the forest. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that was for a whiz. <laughs> What's the, what's the biggest mistake you've made, Jeremy? Well, I was thinking about the last question as well about, and I have a slightly unusual answer, which is, which is my future self. Mm. And, um, you know, I, 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 someone recently asked, uh, well, about four years ago, if they could write my obituary. And... <laughs> and, and, and not your, it, not uh, your spouse, I hope. But, <laughs> not your spouse, I hope. <laughs> And, and, you know, I said, I said to him, <laughs> I said to him, what the hell are you talking about? And, and, he, said, and he said, well, j just let's do it. And, and I said, well, I want to live happy to 100. And I gave him purpose, love, health, and gratitude as my ingredients for happiness. 
and he, he, he wrote down, he, and then he wrote um, uh, the obituaries, and I said, it's, it's just got to be for me. You know, I don't want anyone else to see it. And, and he, he said, um, he did it, and then, and then we were skiing together, and he said, actually, I've got your obituary here, and you die tomorrow. <laughs> and, um, and he read it out to me, and he said, you know, you've, been, you've pioneered and industrialized an industry, and uh, you're a total bore. That was my obituary. <laughs> and he said, I have another obituary. And I'm not saying I live up to this, but he, he just said, I have another obituary. Um, you don't die at 100, you die at 98. And you're an amazing 98-year-old. Uh, and so I was curious to hear what I'd done. <laughs> and uh, you know, and, he, and he, he wrote down what I'd done, which was a business school. He wrote down that ch uh, change pension policy in Africa and pension po pensions create vibrancy, economic vibrancy and social security. And, I, and I'm reading it and actually I'm picturing myself as a 98 year old and, and, I, and, and I say to myself, you know, I can get the business school, I get that my business becomes great, but um, it's not authentic for me about pension policy in Africa, but if I could save a few animals from a concentration camp, that would be authentic for me. And so he wrote down that I end animal factory farming, uh, which it sounds ridiculous, but it's a bit like end poverty now. There's no middle route. And, and, and so, and then I asked him last year why he did it. It, it took me a couple of years to ask him why, why he did it. And he said, I thought you needed a CEO's note from the top of a mountain. And it's been amazing that to me, I mean, within myself, that um, once you have a destiny, you know, like Naomi with um, uh, fashion, what's it, what's it called? Fashion for relief. Fashion for relief. Once you have a destiny, it's amazing how serendip your antennae go up mm. and serendipity happens and allows, and, and you ask yourself, under what conditions can you make it happen? And, and I, I think that's been a very powerful, I've got too many mistakes to, to, to go through, but that's been a very powerful driver to know that we're so limited by our own expectations. And that, you know, if you have a, you know, as Martin Luther King said, if you have a dream, um, it's under what conditions can you make that dream happen? And, and it goes back to being unreasonable and everything else. Mm. Mm. And I'm sure that r possibly resonates. Why? Um, I, you know, I push myself and expectations, and every time I'm, I've been told no. Please. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is too early. It's um, jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, my, it's microphone malfunction time, day at Milken. No, no, I, um, no, I push myself and. I've always been told no from throughout my career. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. It's never happened before. Um, as I was saying yesterday, I don't really take no for an answer. But I was able to understand the business enough for fashion to go to the designers and say, well, they're saying I can't do this because of the color of my skin. And I don't accept that. I wasn't raised that way. So I work for you. You're Yves Saint Laurent. What are you going to do about it? And he'd be like, well, I'm just going to pull the advertising from the magazine. And they'd get threatened. Obviously, they need that money. And then they'd put me. But that was without me having to say, you have to give me that cover. Or you have to, yeah. you know, there's just ways to go around it. But it's also been no, the day that I started Fashion Free Leaf. I started it because of Hurricane Katrina. And because New Orleans was the first state of the United States that I ever went to in 2000, uh, no, 1984. And I was told no about that. And it's just really getting to the right person and someone that's bigger than you, the boss. And if he says no, no. But at least going to the boss, you get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Going to the middle person, it's like, well, they don't want it to happen. So the answer is just going to be no right away. So I believe in picking up the phone to people that I've never met in my life. And if they get on the phone and saying, hi, I'm Naomi, I'd like to speak to you about such and such. And you get your answer and then you know where you're at. And that's how I like to deal with things. Is there one particular thing that you can point to when you look back 
as a mistake you made, be it public or, or private? Oh, I've made so many. <laughs> I'm not Haven't we all? So many. <laughs> Is there one particular thing that changed your life? Um, I think my work oh. saved my life mm. in many ways. Um, I mean, I've gone through so many different areas of colours of work and... Um, you know, I've, start, I've worked and I stopped work for five years, lived in Russia for five years, went back to work. I think it's saved, it's, it's all been so different and each time I've come back, it's been a great welcome, but I've been, I feel now in my life, I'm embracing it in a different way. So I really prefer right now to be behind in, as opposed to in front. But you do in front for appearance purposes and to keep the profile up and everything. But um, I like sharing what I've learned. Um, I do get a lot of the models, especially in Victoria's Secrets times rolls up, please teach me how to walk, please teach me how to this. And I do it because I felt that my time when I started with a lot of the models then, they, they taught me. So I think you have to give back. So that's something I'm happy doing. And I'm happy acting. I'm happy to try different things. I don't, I'm not someone who has fear of going into the unknown and trying something different. I want to learn as much as I can mm. before my time is up. And more importantly, I want to help as much as I can before my time is up. Mm. So leaving a legacy? Not planning to, but um, you know, I guess in some way, there's people around me who want to do that. Mm. I'm just happy to just keep doing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is this about a legacy for you? Do you want to leave a legacy? I just want my kids to respect me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't at the moment. Well, I have teenage kids. You know how it is. I mean, it's... Uh, well, actually, Joe, that, uh, that could be something to do with your dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's human nature to, uh, to think about uh, when you're no longer around that the people that, are, that come after you will look up and say, hey, we have somebody to learn from. Uh, look at what this guy has, has done. Uh, so from that point of view, yes, I think legacy is important. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, today, uh, you know, as we do uh, run our business from day-to-day -day standpoint, uh, the important thing is uh, to set an example uh, for the people that uh, work for you, mm. uh, for our team. And uh, I think that's the most important thing for the time being. Yeah. For the time being. Yeah. It's, a, it's about taking the people with you, I suppose, on the journey that each individual person is on. And, and John, that might be a little bit harder for you when it comes to salaries. I mean, something as simple as money, is it not? You're talking about the difference between you go, when you go and take a meeting when you were a Microsoft executive and someone would say, yes, because you've got money behind you, but when you're, going, when you're building a charity, you're coming from the other end. Yeah, but so what, what the challenges for us at Rimnery is we want to hire basically private sector caliber talent, but on a public sector salary. So it takes a special kind of person to come in. Typically when we interview, the first question we ask is about your background, and if someone talks about education, or their mother getting a lucky break, or their grandfather being the one to pull their family out of poverty because of education, then you know you're kind of on the right track with that interview. Um, nobody, obviously nobody comes to work for an NGO expecting to make a lot of money. The question really is, are people willing to make, to take a, a difference in their lifestyle? Uh, and work for a public sector salary. One thing I discovered very early on, though, was that what I could do is ask people, to say people, people don't quit your job. You don't have to quit your job to be a full-time do-gooder. I did. Keep your job, but give 5%, 10%, 15% of your bandwidth to help us build out a global network that can take Room to Read up to a whole new level. So, you know, Brooks and Laura and Twistle are here, for example. Brooks was running Goldman India at the time. Brooks and Laura said, we're going to start a Mumbai chapter for you. And the first time in the history of Mumbai, we're going to have a fundraising event that will raise a million dollars in a night. And a lot of people told them that doesn't happen in India. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They didn't just do it once. They did it, they did it twice in a row, two years in a row, raising that money. So what I've tried to do is to try to figure out how do you have full-time employees, and we have 1,400 full-time employees around the world, keep them motivated. I'm very proud with our Fulton employees to say that 50, I was on a board call late last night, so I've got my little dashboard of diversity and inclusion. I'm very proud to say that 90% of our employees are local national. They're close to the customer. We don't have American expats driving around in land rivers bossing the local people around. 
We have Cambodians, Cambodians in Cambodia, Tanzanians in Tanzania, South Africans in South Africa. So 90% plus, we have one of the most diverse workforces in the world. 56% of our employees are women. 49% of our line managers are women. Our CEO, second generation CEO, I was first, but our second generation CEO, Erin Ganju, is a woman, and four of her six direct reports are women. And we often joke that a lot, in a lot of companies you have women in leadership initiatives. At Room to Read, we've done something radically different. We simply have women in leadership. A lot better solution. Um, secondly is the volunteers. And basically, I'm building out a base of 10,000 plus volunteers who run fundraising chapters around the world from Tokyo to Zurich to London, inviting them in and basically trying to be very humble to say, we want Room to Read to be open source. We want as many people as possible to get involved in it. And if you want to get, be involved, email me, john at roomtoread.org. I'm ready to hear from you. I'm ready to talk to you, ready to get you involved. Now, that takes a certain degree of humility because you can get rejected. Mm -hmm. And I'll close on that point about rejection, because when you ask what, what question when I ask a smart person, I would say, well, how do you, what do you do when your day sucks? Or what do you do when you come out of a meeting that was just really, really deflating? Mm -hmm. And I take it really personally, because when I was at Microsoft, if we lost a deal, let's say to Apple, that hurt. But the reality was that customer was still going to have a pretty good product. If we lost an office, you know, Microsoft office sale, Somebody could, I'm going to date myself here, but they could still use Lotus 1, 2, 3 or WordPerfect. <laughs> they, still had, they still had a solution. When you're doing what we do, though, everything, every deal is very, very binary. If I ask a family to fund a school project or if I ask a company to help us to get 1,000 more girls on long-term scholarships to get them through secondary school, and if they say no, then I feel like I'm letting those kids down. It's not like, oh, well, some other group besides Room Tree will go in. There's not some other group waiting in the wings. It's just very binary. If we don't reach these kids, and kids grow up quickly, there's, the alternative is apathy, it's poverty, it's continued gender discrimination, because two-thirds of those who are out of school in the developing world are girls and women. So for me, I gotta sometimes just calm myself down, because I get really intensely um, unhappy when things don't go the way they go, hopefully not because of ego, but simply because I view myself and this organization as a conduit through which we can reach the world's children before nefarious forces from apathy to misogyny to Al-Qaeda and ISIS can reach them. Okay, we are going to open the floor to questions. One question over here. We've got two roving mics, so if you've got questions, stick your hands up very high. There's also one at the back here. So we've got two out here. Uh, Mika, just while we're waiting for that mic to move over there, if there was one thing that you want your children to take away from what you've done, what would it be? I'm sorry? If there was one thing that you would want your children, all the world's children, to take away from what you do, what would it be? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have five children myself, so uh, uh, I, I know exactly what's going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite a challenge uh, to answer that yeah. question. It's not so it's not so easy. Uh, I, I I can I am part of the healthcare business myself, uh, and and why I entered that kind of uh, business because when I was a motor racing driver, there was uh, we had a maximum healthcare all the time. You know, training, doing a physical training. Uh, seven days a week, I have no fitness training all the time taking care of me. And at the time when I was racing Formula One in, in late 90s, this was just growing this kind of importance that way the racing driver is fit. Uh, why it has to be fit? Because this young man was traveling around the world all the time. Different time differences, different food, uh, uh, facing the media. You have to be athletic to drive a racing car, communicate with the team. So, so the health become very important part of the success. And, and uh, today, the company, what I'm part of it, taking care of the 80% of the Grand Prix drivers about their health, mental health and physical health, uh, which is a great success. So, so we brought the same concept to business people, business people who are traveling around the world going from the airport directly to the meeting, and they had to be sharp. They had to make quick decisions. 
So answer your question, basically, it is a health. Uh, so take care of yourself. Be strong. Okay. Oh, hi. Is it on? Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm Alyssa Grad. I work at Golub Capital, and we're one of the sponsors. So first off, thank you for this amazing panel. Um, and you all have reached a level of success where um, you're not easily attainable. It's not easy to get in touch with you for, for many people. But along the way, um, and I want to ask you to be honest with yourselves about this, uh, as well as a room full of people, can you talk about boundaries uh, pertaining to time management and that as you become more successful, more people want to get in front of you, more people want to pick your brain about things, more people want to ask for advice. And in as much as you all seem so generous, how do you separate that? Because I am not even anybody and I struggle with this. Uh, and I, I wonder if it's because I'm still accessible that I do. Like, did there ever come a point where people stopped asking you for stuff and and how did you process that? Who wants to take that? Yeah? I'm, I'm happy to go quickly, um, and so that I can cede time to other panelists. To, I would say I do, I do two things. I, I don't think you have to be inaccessible at all. I think inaccessible comes across as being that you become a dilettante, and that you then you're kind of, you know, the old line from Broadcast News and William Hurt said, once you believe you run press clippings, you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, and I've always believed that. So I think two things for me about time management. One is that the hours of 7 o'clock to 10.30 p.m. every day are sacrosanct. The iPhone goes to airplane mode because my wife's off of work. Uh, I usually end up with conference calls 10.30, 11, midnight. But 7 to 10.30 is sacrosanct. The phone goes to airplane mode or just gets shut off. And then secondly, exercise six out of seven days a week. It's non-negotiable. Uh, if I need to do it in the middle of the day, if someone sees me walking into the gym here at 4 o'clock today, I don't want them to think negatively that I'm slacking off. Uh, to me, because point, I just think that, to me, my relationship with my wife and being healthy and being able to run marathons is absolutely critical to how I feel and to my balance in life. And so those are the two things I do. And then everything else, every other hour of the day is wide open. Have at me, world. Naomi, do you want to weigh in on, on that? Um. There, it's a fine line, mm. and um, it depends for me. In, in fashion, I've had like a few stalkers in the last 20 years, and it's been, you know, it's not that I knew them or I spoke to them, and then, you know, it's different. Like when I'm doing this, and when I'm with my kids, no matter if it's South Africa, Africa, London, Jordan, it's different. I'm approachable. I want to be reached. Um, I also work in an anonymous program, and it's the same. I'm reachable. My phone's 24-7. If I can speak to someone and save a life, I'm happy. They were there for me. I have to be there for them. But there is that fine line of, in people's minds sometimes, that they see you as this fixture in an image and think you're not real, yeah. but I am. And it's happened to many people, so it's, um, you, it's really you choosing and understanding what's important to you, what's your priority, and what's not. And that's really how, and I do it with, yeah. each case is different. Dividing your time that way. Over at the back, we've got another question. Hi, my question is to John. Could you tell us a little bit about your uh, impact that you're having in India and uh, what are some of the challenges and also what gives you hope there? Yeah, uh, very quickly, India is our largest country of operations. Um, India has to be our largest country of operations because 35% of the illiterate people in the world live in India. So my challenge to Indian business leaders is to say congratulations, GDP growth is strong, profits are good, but your country, which I love, happens to have 35% of the world's illiterate people. Um, so it is our largest country of operation. We're very happy that India passed that 2% law, where if your turnover as a company is above a certain level, you're required to either give 2% of those profits to social causes like Room to Read, or you can write a letter to the government explaining why you chose not to do so. <clears throat> why anybody would ever write a letter to the Indian government <laughs> trying to explain that is way beyond me, because um, you'll probably end up giving more than 2% then. Um, and uh, it's actually the largest country of ours for our long-term girls education program because we believe that India will never reach its full, full, full potential 
until A, every single boy and every single girl is literate and in the habit of reading, and B, every single young woman is given a chance to get through secondary school with the life skills she needs to negotiate the key decisions she'll make. Um, and we're super excited about where we are in India, mm -hmm. but there's a long, long, long ways to go. Question over at the back in the corner. We've probably got time for two more, so um, give us an indication if you want to ask a question so we know where to bring the mics over to. Okay, so my question is as follows. Alibaba and Room to Read have similar numbers in how many sellers Alibaba has and how many children <laughs> and students you educated and gave literacy to. We saw earlier what AI and robotics is going to change. Workforce development is a major issue. The education you're giving the girls, are they going to be prepared to be beyond not only sellers but building the future jobs? And what is going to be with Alibaba's 10 million plus sellers? So what is the, what is the, the question? <laughs> <laughs> what is their jobs going to be? How are you taking what are the jobs 10 of the million future? girls that you are educating, how are you educating workforce development to have the skills for the future? Rather than just be say, well, Joe, why don't you take that? Because you do a lot of work into this. What are the jobs I, of the future? Well, I think one thing that we teach the young people at Alibaba is to be uh, open-minded and flexible. So you are not pigeonholed into a particular skill set. What so to to education to the point about education is we want to teach kids to learn how to learn. Uh, and, and that education is a continuous thing. It doesn't stop after university. It continues. Um, I, I'm learning new things every day. Uh, just like, think about it, to, to the AI reference, uh, you're training machines. The machine gets smarter every day as you feed more data into it. So the machine is learning, getting smarter every day. Human beings should be able to get smarter every day. So, so then that leads to another question, um, something that Jeremy and I were talking about earlier on. How do you join the dots? When we're in a world right now that is so uncertain, technology is changing, as you talked about, every single day. How do you make the next decision about what to do next when you have no idea what it's going to look like? Uh, well, I, I think you have to, pre uh, to have some predictive uh, powers. Uh, to, you have to identify what you believe is, is the trend. Uh, I think the most important thing is believing, not predicting. Predict everybody can make predictions. McKinsey can make predi predictions, right? You can hire consultants to make predictions. Uh, but once the prediction is made, uh, believing in it and commit, committing to it, and that's the most important thing. Mm. OK, any other questions? Up the front here. Just down here. You each have fascinating vantage points from where you sit. And I, in closing, I would love to learn a little bit about, from, from your perspective, what are some of the biggest, or I guess what would be the one big challenge that you see us facing as a global civilization that maybe we're not paying enough attention to? And then on a higher note, what is something that you are feeling a great deal of hope about and excitement about looking forward? Jeremy, why don't you kick off with that one? Uh, so there's a lot of talk about um, feminism. There's, there's a lot of talk about racism. We haven't addressed speciesism. And, um, and I think that's one of the most important topics that, that is, going to ra is raising its head now as factory farming has, has uh, snuck up upon us in the last 40 years. There's a great panel at 2.30 on feeding <laughs> the planet next door. This is how you do business. Take every opportunity. <laughs> uh, Mika, what do you think? Well, uh, again, it's a very good question. Uh, but I'm I, I coming back again about uh, to health. Uh, I think that's going to be a big challenge in the future because the population is just growing flat out all the time. Uh, so the healthcare has to improve in every country and the medicine. What, what concerns you when you look forward, when you look ahead? Oh my God, the world is in total mess. Which is kind of scary. Uh, yeah. 
in every aspect, like climate change. You're, you're, you're. Oh, God, sorry. Um, that's that the world in entirety is a mess right now in climate change um, and the people we have leading it. Um, I feel that egos have to be put away and like most people, and we live in a very uncertain time. And, um, you know, you say you don't believe in climate change, but look what just happened last week. It's... Nothing's for granted. You can take nothing for granted, and that's what I've learned. Mm. Joe? Well, I think the problem is too depressing, but it's already, people have already focused on it. It's the, uh, the, the wealth gap, the disparity between the wealthy and the, and the rest. Uh, uh, but there's so much lip service to it, but not, not enough people doing much about it. I'd rather focus on sort of the positive aspect. Looking out to the future, I think, don't underestimate young people. That's, it's, it's, uh, you know, we tend to think, oh, you know, these people have no experience. Uh, but the young people today, because of technology, because of the internet, because of the mobile phone, uh, young people are smarter than you think. Mm. And they, uh, in fact, can also mature uh, very quickly. Mm. And we've, uh, I've seen that uh, uh, development. Uh, so I'm very hopeful, uh, and, and we want to support uh, the young generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for this wonderful panel that we've got here today.